Yeah, All right. I'll do it once it's frozen enough. <laughs> frozen. <laughs> All right. So let's let's get started. Um, Michael, do you want to um, to show us the one that you guys got? Uh, Ryan, help with pronunciations. Say le dolomi. Le dolomi. Okay. Um, uh, Vin de France, of uh, Vin de Franco. Yep. Sorry. Vin de France. Arco. Vin de France, Arco, 2018. Okay. Can... And this is what's going on on the back. Cote de Jura, nice. Interesting. Okay. Pretty cool label. Yeah. I don't know what this is actually. It's probably just well, white wine blend, right? Exactly. Um, Kendra, why don't you go next? Yes. Okay. I am doing a Provence. So I have a Coteau Verrois en Provence. Um, it's a Cinso Grenache um, Syrah blend. Okay. Um, I have, this is, uh, all right. So right here, I apologize for the glare. But this is from Savoy. Uh, it is uh, from a region called, um, where is it here? Xin, Xijin? Xinyan? Xinyan? Maybe? <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly, um, but we'll find out. Um, is it's it the Swiss? Produce. It is, we, we shall see. Uh, it is a product of France. It is from André, André and Michel Cournard. And it is a product of France, but as we will see, um, what's kind of interesting, I don't know if you can see this, but the cross is also on the bottle itself and also yeah. on the label. Yeah. So you'll see why in a little bit. Um, Ajda, do you have your bottle there or you? Um... Let me grab it real quick. It's in the freezer. Okay. <laughs> It is also from Savoie, I think. It is a. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. It is a Cuvée Gastronomie 2019 Après 100% Jacquer. Yep. And did you notice there's the uh, Swiss cross on the bottle itself as well? Oh, you're right. Whoa, there's going to be some history here. Mm -hmm. History yep. lessons to learn. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. But it is also a product of France. So. Yep. <laughs> okay. So with that, I am going to jump into our presentation. Okay, let me just get myself all set here. Good. <clears throat> all right, so we are talking about today uh, some of the more obscure French wine regions. And <clears throat> you might think um, Provence might not be that obscure. The truth is up until about 15 years ago, it was pretty obscure. People really didn't think about Provence in terms of fine wine and France. So what, you know, what are the areas we're talking about? What do they look like? Well, here's a picture of some vineyards in, in Jura. And one of the things that comes out quite quickly is, at least for me, oh. are the hills. And we're starting to see some substan substantial hills here, um, in some ways, similar to Alsace. Uh, it is a border region with, um, <coughs> with uh, excuse me, with Switzerland. So you're seeing some of those um, hills. Are you sharing your screen? Uh, you know what? I should probably share my screen. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm the only one who gets to take a look at it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there All we right. go. Hey. All right. So this, you see, this is me trying to talk, present, and open a bottle of wine <laughs> at the same time. 
Um, so you can you can see what I what I was talking about now. You can yeah. see the hills. Um, if you remember the picture that are <coughs> the pictures that um, uh, Kendra had shared last week, you can see some of the similarities in terms of the shapes and the way that the uh, uh, <coughs> the vineyards are laid out. Let's go one to our next location, Savoy. And now this starts looking a little bit more like what I would call an alpine wine region. You're definitely higher in the hills. Uh, the slopes are a little steeper and you can start seeing those snow capped mountains, which we start to associate with places like Switzerland. Okay. Some uh, terraces as well. Yep, right there. And also, if you have a keen eye, you might notice uh, white soils up here, which could be limestone or chalk or some of the soils that we've been talking about in previous um, previous sessions. Okay, the last one, um, <coughs> uh, Provence. Um, many up until, like I said recently, People considered Provence more as a tourist destination rather than just a wine destination and uh, associated with the architecture of the region um, and not necessarily the wines, but as we will go uh, find out <coughs> rel <coughs> relatively soon, um, that's not exactly true. It's the wines there are improving quite dramatically. So now that we have a sense of what they, the regions so, uh, partially look like, let's look at where they are. <coughs> so this is a map of all the um, districts within, um, or departments within um, France. There, the darker borders are where the districts are, which are kind of like the states or provinces. Um, and if you look up here to the top, you'll see the Bas Rhein and Hoch Rhein. This is um, the two regions that um, uh, Kendra was talking about last week, or last week in Alsace. Today we're going to look at Jura, Savoy, and then Provence down here. Um, and you'll notice that we have this white area out here. This is actually where Switzerland is. So. Jura has a close proximity with a small part bordering um, bordering Switzerland, whereas Savoy has a significant border with Switzerland. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at each region independently. Um, because we're looking at three regions, we're not going to be able to go too deep into each one, um, but we will be able to, at the end of each one, we'll do part of our assessment. So feel free to start sipping and making notes on your wines. And we will be um, we'll be evaluating the first part, appearance and nose after Jura. So with that, <clears throat> um, first bit of trivia, Jura. It's named after the age of the the soil or the rock in the region and yes it is jurassic um there i could have put a lot of bad jokes here i could put a dinosaur in here i resisted but just know it is true the region is named after the jurassic era of um of rock in the region so what does the region look like well um as we've kind of started our regional session, we're staying in the east of France, working our way from north to south. Um, when you get to Jura, it's in the eastern part of France, um, close to Switzerland. It, it's relatively close to Burgundy as well. Um, there it is, most of the vineyards are on, you know, in the hills or in some of these, flat lying areas. Um, there is a, riv a river that goes through it, this, uh, the Seon River. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of limestone in this area. 
um, just like with the other regions that are kind of in the east of France that are a little more landlocked, it is continental um, <coughs> with long cold winters and hot summers. Um, there is some protection from the Jura Mountains, uh, similar to the Vosges Mountains, but th the, um, the Jura Mountains, instead of being consistently on one side, are kind of all around. Um, <coughs> and you have that, um, <coughs> excuse me, one sec. John's not feeling so well <laughs> this week. Okay, um, there's a mix of soils and the climate, like I said, uh, similar to Alsace, but a little more extreme because it has a little bit of that less protection. Um, you know, you do get, you do get um, some variation in vineyard location from uh, in the foothills um, with altitude aspect and slope, um, but you know, it is, it's a small region in general. It doesn't produce a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of wine. There are two signature styles um, that I will get into. That is why this area um, is is covered quite in detail in a lot of um, a lot of uh, French wine literature. Um, but it's not that big, right? Um, it is only about eighteen hundred hectares uh, planted. Um, and it's only 80 kilometers north to south. So um, it's bigger It's bigger than Napa Valley in terms of length, but approximately the same amount of uh, vineyards planted. So on the map, you can see the main appellations, uh, Chateau Chalon, uh, which is this area right in here. It's the location for a classic wine of the region called Vin Jaune. Uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit of detail. Uh, this region, Etoile, which um, means when translated into English, star. And it is, um, it's called that because, again, we were talking about Jur Jurassic area, uh, Jurassic era soil. This actually is that the, you have some starfish fossils that are in the soil here, which is what lent the name to Etoile. Um, RBO, or Herbois, Herbois, up here, is famous for something other than wine. It's the home of Louis Pasteur, um, and he. this is where the place where he invented penicillin, which maybe I could use a little bit of today. Um, but um, it's also one of the classic regions in this area. And then you see Cote de Jura is basically captures everything else. Okay. So grapes. Um, you know, just this is we're getting into regions now where um, the you have to know the name of the region or the appellation to understand what's going into the wine. Um, in in Jura, um, there are quite a few grapes that are used, but here are the most common ones um, and the ones that you can use in terms of appellation names. So Chardonnay is there. And again, we talked about that. I talked about the proximity to Burgundy, but it's gonna be more in the lower lying areas. Uh, Savigny, Savigny, um, it is the key white grape in the area. It's used to make the two signature styles of the area, um, Vin Jaune and Vin de Pays, which is one is um, a sherry-like wine and the other is a sweet, uh, sweet wine. And then um, in reds, we have Lussard, Trousseau and Pinot Noir. Uh, my backup bottle for today was um, a Cote de Jura, which happens to be a blend of Trousseau and Pinot Noir. Okay. So 
again, we're talking about the regions needing to be uh, a little bit more about um, the styles ref are now reflected in the place names. So the wine styles of Jura are, you know, fresh whites. In white wines, you have the fresh whites, the oxidized style, which is that Vin Jun, and then a sweet wine, which is the Vin de Pays. Um, there's red wines tend, tend to be dry reds. They're either varietals or blends. And then um, one of the interesting things is, um, we'll, and we'll find this probably in most regions, is they make a sparkling wine. And uh, this region has been making sparkling wine from about the same time as Champagne, uh, doing it in traditional method, but it wasn't, oh, sorry. It wasn't accounted for or uh, considered a, um, a style of the region until it was introduced in 1995, even though they had been making it for a long time. Um, so Cote de Jura, like I said, that catch all for all, uh, the styles of wine, um, Chateau Chalon is mostly associated with Vin Jun, which is yellow wine. It's a hundred percent, uh, Sauvignon. Um, it's in barrel for at least six years. It can only be released on the 15th of this, of December six years after its harvest. Um, it, and I'll talk a little bit about how it's made on the, the, the next slide. Um, at 12, like I said, it's named after the, um, the, the soil there, uh, but it's white wines only. So it's typically blends of uh, Chard, curiously Pulsard as well, and Sauvignon. Uh, Pulsard, if you remember, was, um, a red grape, but it is a fairly thin-skinned red grape. So like Pinot Noir, if you press it, you're getting clear juice from it. Um, and it does make an oxidative style as well, uh, similar to Vin Jun, but um, it it doesn't use the same name. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. So I've talked about this wine quite a bit already. Um, Vin Jun, a couple of things about it. It is very much like a sherry. Um, it comes in a very classic distinct bottle shape. It's only 60, 620 milliliters. So it's not a full bottle uh, that we're used to in terms of 750 milliliters. Um, when I say it's made in a sherry style, what after the, the juice is pressed, and fermented, um, it'll be aged in a barrel with a little bit of open space so that it will, it will oxidize. However, it will form a layer of yeast or natural yeast on the top of it um, called floor, and that will protect it a little bit, but it will also allow it to develop uh, rich, more nutty flavors, and it uh, gains a deep yellow color. And that's where the name comes from. How do um, they the floor yeast? Pardon? How do they um, encourage the floor yeast? Uh, so barrel. with uh, in barrel, so there's that little space of oxygen and there will still be a little bit of sugar in the wine and that will allow, attract the yeast to the wine and allow it to um, consume some of the nutrients in the wine they may top up a little bit uh, to continue to have nutrients in there, and that allows the, the floor to be consistent. Uh, one big difference between Savoy and uh, Juarez, where sherry is made, is definitely the temperature. Mm -hmm. So the floor is not as thick and not as consistent as it would be in sherry. But it's so naturally found in the wineries? Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's naturally occurring. At least from my memory. Yeah, I haven't studied it, so that was a real honest question. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, uh, it is. It's naturally occurring and developing, um, which is what uh, is makes this a, a very unique style because it's it's really about the place where it's being made, 
more than the um, the production method, even though the production method is very unique. Um, <clears throat> the other unique style in um, Chateau Chalon um, AOP is this uh, Vin de Pay. And this is a, a style of wine we see throughout Europe where um, healthy berries are picked and then dried for several re weeks to concentrate the sugars and flavors and then make a sweet wine out of it. Um, generally, this is done in cooler areas where um, you know it, you can't get full ripeness. But as we'll see as we go through other areas, it's done even in warm areas. It's just a, a way to get more concentrated uh, sugars so that you can have a naturally fermented sweet wine. Okay. Is this considered like a dessert wine or not? So the answer is, is if you had a second option, it would be yes to both. Um, sherries and these styles of wines can be done as aperitifs. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be done as desserts because of the way that you see here on the tasting profile, it's not completely dry. Some of them will have a little bit of residual sugar, but um, you can also see they have pretty high acidity. So it is, it, they're going to be a good match or foil for a lot of types of desserts. But they're also great at um, waking, wakening uh, somebody's palate. So as an aperitif, they're really good as well. Okay. So that was a real quick cover of Eura. But that's because we're trying to cover three regions today. So we're going to do our nose and appearance on the, our current wines. Um, and since it's only the four of us today, I will participate as well, but, um, and, but I'll get my tasting note written afterwards so that you have a copy of that as well. Um, let's start with Ryan or Michael, either of you want to get guys want to start with appearance and um, notes. Sure. <laughs> um, in terms of the appearance, like, I feel like it is a gold, but I'm not sure whether to call it a medium or a deep gold. I feel like I've perhaps seen I like deep. really, I feel like I've seen deeper Chardonnays. Okay. So I'm not sure. I'm a little torn because I just don't know like how deep does gold go. Does the color go right out to the rim when you look at it from a 45 degree angle? Yes, um, it does. Yeah, so if it goes all the way, then go with deep for sure. Okay. Yeah, so deep intensity gold. I said medium intensity uh, on the nose and my, pri my primary was red apple, uh, like really pronounced. Uh, it was almost overpowering of the other. I had to really hunt for the rest. Um, I got also sour cherries and whetstone. Mm. Barely any whetstone, but a little bit. Mm. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay, so um, let's start with kind of, you started with red apple. Um, so are there anything else in that kind of area? Do you get like... Um, any pear, um, any of that white fruit? Yes. Brown pear. What okay. else? I put yellow apple. I'm not sure. It, for me, I, I don't know if it's. I could be red. Yes. But it didn't feel quite like as sweet as the red apple is. Okay. Um, yellow apple. It feels like a cider almost without any like bubbles to me. Interesting. Okay, so let's play with that a little bit. Um, so did you get any of that kind any um so with ciders I sometimes get a little bit of creamy notes or some of the secondary characteristics. Did you get any of that at all? Mm. 
think of when beers and ciders to me you get a lot of the fermentation um aromas yeah, in it about... not really okay. okay i'm not saying they're there i'm just saying let's play play out some of what you guys are saying that's good but not really it's okay. just this fruit and then a little bit of wet stuff that i smell okay no citrus at all not really no interesting no herbs or anything like that from it's just so apple-y to me <laughs> okay <laughs> to find it, like, yeah. i really had to stretch even to just find pear okay no that that's that, that's good so um we're in jura in uh, savoy we're in much cooler regions right even though it's continental um it's inland it's a little bit higher altitude so even in the summer it's going to be a little cooler than it is say in alsace or e um even in neighboring burgundy so but because it's that little bit cooler we're going to get a lot more of the fresher aromas which makes sense why apple is the the predominant of what you're getting Okay, um, let's go to Adam and Ajda. <clears throat> All righty. We're laughing because we're having a similar experience to um, Ryan and Michael. Uh, obviously, it's a different um, different wine, but go for it, Ajda. It's, uh, so in terms of appearance, it's pale lemon. And I... Uh, Medium minus, I would say, in the nose intensity. We gotta really stick our toes in there to, mm -hmm. to get something. But predominantly, like I smelled peach and honey like right off the bat. Like it's like sweeter smells. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we were trying to look for citrus, but there isn't any citrus. <laughs> we're like, what? <laughs> Actually, the for both of you, um, you know, Ryan and Michael come back to you guys. What about floral notes? Okay. Nothing? I mean, no. I don't really smell any florals. I just okay. haven't smelled flowers in a long time though, so maybe that's that yeah, it is it is winter in New York. Yeah. We smell snow. Mm. Lots of it. And yellow snow. Yeah. <laughs> Brown snow. <laughs> yeah. It's mud. Mud. Oh. Sure. oh my gosh. Slush. Come on. Slush. Come on. Exactly. All right. Um, keep. Yeah, go ahead. So I identified what I was smelling. I also was smelling like <clears throat> it felt like I was walking through like a brewery. So like I think I'm smelling like yeasty yeah okay that that that's kind of what i was getting at is yeah when when people say cider to me i automatically think okay we're we're getting into secondary um aromas which are really about the wine making and yeast is definitely one of those common things mm -hmm. so that's um sorry we were focusing on your on cream okay. or milky yeah yeah, it's, yeah my uh, fault now that you mentioned it, there's some yeast smelling nose senses going on over here. Today. Okay, cool. Um, Kendra, you want to do yours? Yeah, sure. Uh, so mine is orange in color. Sorry, the glare is really bad in here right now. But yeah, there's a little bit of orangeness to uh, my wine. Um, my aroma intensity, though, is medium um, and very primary dominant. Um, lots of red fruit, raspberries, cherries, strawberries, um, alongside a little bit of rose, as well as maybe some like melon and some flint, maybe some wet stone. But all the aromas are really like combined and muddled together. Like I have to work really hard to pull each one out. Um, but yeah, there's a little bit of tertiary hints of maybe some dried cranberry or something a little sweeter in there. So yeah. <coughs> So um, my wine, um, this is definitely pale lemon um, and coincidentally, well, yeah, unlike everybody else, this is a medium plus uh, aroma intensity. I'm starting to smell it right about here. 
and it is there's fresh apple pear there's a there's a note of ginger in it there's this little bit of sweetness coming from it um orange citrus definitely some wet stone and some some melon so it's mostly primary flavors all more in the fruit category um but what surprised me is after listening to what you guys everybody else was saying i was expecting it to be lower in intensity and it's pretty it's it's not pronounced but it's up there in intensity um one thing you don't see right now but when i first poured it out of the bottle um there were a lot of air bubbles um so not that it i haven't tasted it yet but i'm sensing it might there might be some spritziness to it it will be interesting to see I, like i said I, i've been talking too much so i haven't tasted it yet but um, we'll see all right um let's get back to the presentation and we're going to jump into savoy um which as the subtitle says yep it's another small french region um wine growing region and how small well um first of all again eastern france but this time without it it is there's major parts of the region that are border on um border with france um hold on one sec okay so um oh too far um so up here you see Lake Le Mans. Um, does anybody know another name for this lake? Sorry, I can't see everybody right now, so I can't tell if anybody's raising their hand. But I guess Lake Geneva. John. That is correct. Hey. <laughs> I read your slide. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> There you go. Uh, you know, bad, yeah, bad teacher. Okay. Um, <laughs> then I'm going to try something else. Does anybody know the name of this river that comes out of Lake Geneva? And Kendra, you can't answer. Mm, okay. Again, I can't see anybody, so I'm just going to tell you. That's the Rhone River that initiates there. So the Rhone River comes down this way, loops back up, and if we were to follow it, it would start extending into the northern Rhone and then head south into the uh, southern Rhone and into the next region or bordering the next region we're going to take a look at, Provence. Uh, that's why I wanted to point it out. The other part here you see this region is it's a lot of small isolated regions so the styles are while it it is all savoy the styles are going to be very different here um similar to jura and similar to alsace there are mountains around it here we do get lakes to help moderate the temperatures uh, but again we're in foothill areas so there's going to be a lot of altitude and aspect and slope that play into um into the region um similar to alsace this is a glacial formed area uh, with erosion from rivers and lakes, which means there are a ton of different soil types here, which is why there are there are very disconnected regions. Um, so we got introduced to some new grapes in in Jura. We're gonna get introduced to a, hot, a whole host of new grapes um in savoy many of these i have not even i haven't tasted um i'm hope i'm tasting at least one or maybe two of them today my wine the back label of my wine does not indicate um what i'm actually drinking but i know it's white grapes um jacquere the this was something that um that uh <coughs> Um, Kendra and I were talking about just before we got onto the call. Jacques Heron Altesse are these 
two grapes that are um, key to Savoy, to their white wines. Um, and as you can see, lots of grapes grown here, um, 23 different allowed grapes. I've listed or shown the five white, main white grapes and the two main red grapes. Um, the, the, the red grape on the left, Mon Mondeus, um, it had been in North America identified as Syrah. It wasn't until fairly recently that it was understood to be a different grape. And then I listed everything else that uh, you can grow in the area and highlighted uh, grapes that we are likely going to be talking about in the future. Okay. So a little, I'm not going to go through this, but I wanted to put this detail into, um, into the slide so that if you want to use it as reference, you have a lot more detail. But I'm going to just talk about three or four of the, the key grapes here. Jacquere, which we talked about a little bit um, on the previous slide, 50% of all the planning. So it's if you get a white wine from Savoy, there's a good chance that um, Jacquere is going to be in it, especially if it's that early, uh, that light drinking uh, or early drinking light alcohol uh, crisp wine. Altez, um, if you get a wine that's a little more white wine from the region that's a little more fuller in character, uh, a little more bold, it's likely going to have Altez in it. And then Mondius, as I said, um, you know, just because of its deep color and acidity and tannins, that's the reason why people thought it of it to be Syrah. Um, but in fact, it is different. And then the last one there, Persan, um, you know, this is, think of a version of Pinot Noir for the region. Um, this, is, it's a really interesting grape and I do, uh, if you do get a chance for Mondeus or Persan, those are two red wines of the region. I think uh, if you can find them, would be interesting to, to try. Um, you know, some of the, there's other native grapes that have been in the area, but you know, they are, um, they're slowly falling to the wayside because nobody's making them with, uh, making up, make, making wines out of them. And again, to understand what you're drinking, you need to know the names of the area. Um, and so you have, um, I've, I've listed uh, the, the, <coughs> the key appellations here. Uh, so Vin de Savoy, basically kind of like Cote de is the catch-all for anything that uh, uses the right, um, the, the right grapes of the area. Um, Roussette de Savoy, I'd be interested in trying one of these. is 100% um, you know, It's kind of, uh, I, never trying the grape, I think it would be interesting to see if I can try and find one. Uh, Cezelle, uh, we talked about sparkling wine being everywhere. Well, Cezelle is that sparkling wine region in, um, in Savoy. Um, it, there, you, as you can see here, they're dry or off dry and they're, they're using white grapes to make it. Um, it is traditional method. And uh, because <coughs> unlike um, Cremant de Jure where they're pulling grapes, from all areas uh, for Saisal, similar to Champagne, although in a much smaller area, you can only use grapes from that region to be able to produce the sparkling wine there. Uh, Bougie or Bougie. Um, yes. So because of all of these regions, um, mm -hmm. are they never varietally labeling? Or they're just putting on the label like Roussette de Savoy? This this is a more classic French region where they are um, they're using the AOP or the region name um, as the identification of the wine. Okay. Um, it's a little far harder to find specific information on the rules here, right. but based on what I've seen, it is location based naming. Okay. Um, I have seen on the back label, they may provide the breakdown of what's in it. Um, yeah. In Jura, I did see that. Savoy, I have not seen that 100%. Um, 
For example, my wine just says white, uh, white Savoy wine. It it's doesn't tell me what's actually in it. Know, like from a marketability standpoint, like people like to see the grape or I guess people maybe wouldn't know what these grapes are. Anyway. Well, yeah, the, the, the challenge for Jura, um, other than Vin Jun and Savoy is not a lot of these grapes or at least these wines get exported. Mm -hmm. It's predominantly uh, um, local consumption. And when I say local, I mean with the, they don't even distribute a lot within uh, within France. It's basically local area. Um, so this area, Uji, I'm going to go back to the map here. You'll see it's this gray area, uh, these gray areas, and they're on the opposite side of the Rhone River. Um, these, again, we're not too far away from the Rhone Valley and Burgundy. And that's why in these areas in Bougie, you'll see uh, you're getting Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, but you're also getting Mondeuse, which is, like I said, got can do, um, um, confused for Syrah. And again, we're close to the Northern Rhone where Syrah is, um, <coughs> is dominant. And so you can see the different styles kind of playing in here on the edges of the um, of the region, whereas where you go to the more classic areas, you're getting it, uh, wines produced from those grapes that we have we don't get a lot of exposure to. Okay, so again, another quick overview of a small region but I wanted to make sure that we get some coverage there. Um, there's, you can find out more information. It's just, it's tough to get it concise to what we want to, to show. Um, so it's time to do some technical analysis and flavor analysis. I'm gonna start with Adam and Ajda this time. Sounds good. You do it this time. I did the smells. I will do it. So it is a dry wine, um, high acidity, no tannins. Um, I have medium minus body. Um, alcohol is like, I don't know, low or medium. It's kind of, we, we couldn't decide and we looked, it's 12.5. I forget if that's just on the board or isn't it? 11. Oh, I thought I said it was 12.5. I'm pretty sure it's 12.5. Um, flavor intensity. So it, it, the, the bottle's a little bit more chilled now. Um, flavor intensity is medium. We had um, the nose intensity at medium minus, but flavor um, on the palate we have is medium. Um, you want to do some flavors? What? It's 11. Oh, it's 11.5. Right. Um, I would say in terms of flavor, always right. I just listen. <laughs> I just listen. Um, there's definitely more citrus that comes out in the taste than we smell. So, um, I would say it's like an orange. Um, like an orange that's almost right, but not quite there yet. So there's a little bit of like a sour element mm -hmm. to it, which is a, so then it made me think of like sourdough, like sour bread. Mm -hmm. In the aftertaste, I, I get that sense of yogurt or sour bread, okay. which is interesting. But it basically does not taste at all like what it smells. You don't get some of the peach stuff. No, I don't get any. I don't. It's it's weird. It's like contradicting <laughs> the smell. Okay. All right. So, um, grassiness to it. I get a little bit of like grassiness to it. Okay. Kendra's and yeah. <laughs> the, grassy, definitely. The the finish. What was um. What was the finish on that? 
I had it at medium minus. I don't know if you agree. Um, yeah, I mean, like the the fruit flavors that we taste, or even the grassiness, doesn't last long. It's the mm -hmm. yogurty slash sour taste that lingers for quite some time. Interesting. Okay, so I um, you know, when we talk about finish, we we say what the the pleasant flavors persist. Um, this is a, a interesting one because I, you're getting the primary flavors drop off sounds like pretty quick and then you're left with sort of the wine making technique flavors which are not negative but they're i'm not sure if i would classify them as positive or flavor so this is a, it's a tough one to to assess for length it, I, I, um, I mean, as long as yeah, you're not it's, left with just the structure of the wine, if you're getting some other flavors, maybe you could let it go a little further to finish. Yeah. <laughs> we got to taste it like that. I know. <laughs> it's like mouthwash. It's like mouthwash. Exactly. I mean, I know you paid uh, more for it Adam, than mouthwash, but Adam's gonna do it. He's grabbing the wine bottle. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the wonders of living in New York is we can put the wine next to the window, yeah. and it will get cold. All right. So you guys keep keep tasting, and we'll come back. Um, but Michael Ryan, you guys are up apple okay. <laughs> and lots of apple apple continues uh in this wine i can also hold on we gotta do the technicals first oh, sorry all right so flavors we said medium uh intensity for the flavor <coughs> now go ahead okay uh <laughs> so the apple continues um i can pick up the air. I also get a bit of honey. Um, and those are the, like the three primary I got, flavors. That what I kind have. of apple? Because I said red apple on the nose, but I changed my flavor to yellow apple. Okay. And it wasn't quite as sweetie of an apple, but I also, but I did get sour cherry, which I also said on the nose. And then I had written that there was something citrus. I wrote, I wrote tiny bit of lemon, but after mm -hmm. Ashta described her kind of like unripe orange thing, I wrote, I changed it to sour orange. Uh, so I, I thought that was more accurate because it's still a pretty sweet citrus. Uh, okay. And actually, um, you're actually, I think we do need to back up. So um, we said it was off dry. Okay said or i we've actually we both said that we both said medium plus acidity right mm -hmm. um it's high alcohol which is probably why we are stumbling on the order of things because i have to... <laughs> yeah. uh, and medium body and the flavor okay. i don't know if i said that already and finish medium plus that because those like fruity apple flavors stick around for a while. Okay. Okay. Um, and did you check the bottle and ver uh, verify that it's it's high alcohol? Uh, I think I did. It is 14.1. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's it's right on right over the edge, um, which now I can understand what you guys are saying. Order is hard to follow at the moment. Yeah, that <laughs> alcohol might be interrupting any sort of aroma and flavors, you know? <coughs> yeah. yeah. It's John, do they chaptalize in this reason region? Uh so there is no clear information on that, but uh with it being a cooler region, um chapelization is always uh, available. 
this would be in so there's a class classification in what is that? euro chapelization is being able to add sugar um during fermentation to raise the potential alcohol of the wine uh does so if it ferments and potential alcohol means if it was to ferment dry this is what it would be so um in cooler regions if you get a cool vintage where the sugar the natural sugars aren't very high you can add enough sugar to in the coolest of regions to raise the potential alcohol up to two percent um so your you guys have it's a wine from savoy or jura i can't remember jura sure so that would be there i there's i can't remember the exact numbers but it wouldn't the coldest regions are generally in germany so here the the amount of sugar they would be able to add should only be able to raise the potential alcohol by one percent but even that can have a dramatic impact and it also could be why the wine has off dry versus dry because some of that natural some of the sugars um may not have fermented fully and they may not have wanted it to because if it did you're probably looking at a wine that's closer to 14.5 alcohol rather than 14.1 sorry that was a that was a lot of information oh no, it's very, very interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. good assessment though guys like by saying off dry but also noticing the really high amounts of acidity um yeah that's good all right kendra do you want to go yeah. start to catch on. <laughs> okay so my wine is also off dry and it has a medium plus acidity as well um medium alcohol medium body <coughs> In flavor intensity definitely a medium itis wine um all the same kind of red fruits watermelon maybe a little bit of wood or wet rock in the palette too um and then the finish is also medium um with kind of those fresh red fruits um finishing it off so um not that it's a bad wine in any way but yeah it's a very kind of medium run-of-the-mill rosé um I'll do my mine quick. Um, so my wine is dry, um, high acid, no tannin and medium alcohol. Uh, flavor intensity is medium plus, which matches the, the nose. Um, on the palate, definitely get that fresh ginger, um, lemon lime there's a bit of jasmine coming through as well um some some orange zest instead of orange um citrus um whetstone and i'll stop there there's a couple other things that i can't quite distinguish it right now but i also want to keep us moving along um okay Actually, we're not doing too bad for time today. Okay. All right, so uh, let's finish off um, with Provence. Um, like, um, you know, again, my subtitle is kind of, I, I try to give you a sense for what's coming in the, um, in the individual section. And um, up until fairly recently, you know, Provence was not, not held in high esteem. And now, today, when people think of Provence, they think of rosé. The truth is, it's a little bit more. But let's start with start with a little bit of history. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the things is about uh, about this region, which kind of gets underlooked and overlooked, is that it is the first, um, the birthplace of wine in France. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because the Greeks um, were the first to bring winemaking to France, um, and they did so in this region. Now, um, if you remember in your history classes, uh, the Greeks um, 
They like to travel by water when they were going to new places. Um, they often stayed towards the coasts, which means um, there isn't a lot of history of Greek wine further inland in France. Um, after the, the Greek empire fell, the Romans came in and they kind of took over um, these regions where Greeks were and brought more refinement to the wine industry. And the two images you see here on the top, classic Roman architecture. Um, and on the bottom, it's a little harder to tell, but you can see the columns and uh, some of the shapes that are more associated with Greek architecture. And this is um, a place called Galen in Provence. Uh, that is was an ancient Greek city that was taken over by um, taken over by the Romans. Um, I, I've repeated this multiple times now, so you've. Um, I apologize if you think that there's crappy wine in Provence, but you know historically it was a region of of poorly made rosés, mass production rosés, and mostly consumed by the tourist industry of the region. Um, however, in recent times, you know, there, um, there's been an increased interest in the red wines that have been made in the area and the vastly improved quality of rosés that have made in the area. Um, you do have to remember rosés traditionally in France um, up until I'm going to say even as little as 20 years ago were more fuller body, richer color uh, type uh, wines that had some aging potential but weren't the bright crisp styles that we are used to now. Would you say, um, sorry to interrupt, but would you say was, the change in the way that they make rosés like contributed to the rise of rosés and their popularity? Absolutely, yes. Um, I don't know, Kendra, if you remember, but I, I, I actually wrote one of my assignments for um, in in my one of my WSEC courses called the the rise uh, the rise of rosé and. Um, Rosé has, people had called it a fad, but it's actually become, um, it's it's become a trend. And understanding the difference is, it can be um, a fine line, but the fact that people, the, the term, when I, I think I did this paper in 2019, um, the reference to Rosé all day had something like at its its uh, prime, seventy five thousand hits in a day. It it was crazy, but what's made it a trend is it's still going. People are still drinking rosé. Um, it wasn't a one year or or a six month or a one month thing. It's still uh still very much a trending style. I think it's here to stay. <laughs> And and I completely agree because the the only thing that will risk it, as as we've seen with other wines that have become very popular very quickly, is that to take advantage of it, you'll get producers that take shortcuts to get to market quicker, which is for rosé is extremely short to begin with, um, and you get start getting a whole bunch of poor quality rosés that turn people off. That's the only risk there is right now. Okay. That, uh, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Again, I lost track of people's faces, so I can't see any reactions right now. Um, so, um, the other thing of kind of geeky, and now we're Wait moving on. No, we're not on mute. I'm sharing my thoughts. Because oh. <laughs> again, they <laughs> trend like a few years ago, and now we're we're moving on to Sancerre. I feel like that's the next thing. Mm -hmm. I I like where you're going. Uh, Sancerres are 
definitely um, up. Uh, I definitely enjoy them as well. Um, and when we get to Loire Valley, we'll, uh, there's a, <laughs> a bunch of other things you should be looking at as well. Okay. Um, any other comments before I jump on to the next thing? Well, I mean, here's my other argument for why I think um, Provence Rosé is here to stay. Um, it's, it's very cheap to make, right? It's very, they do everything in stainless steel. Um, it's a very short skin maceration uh, and it's quick in the bottle and they can sell it right away. So they're not having to sell her and hold anything. And, you know, it's kind of a seasonal wine, right? Like as soon as it's really hot outside, we all want, you know, that kind of nice, light, crisp wine. I think even like the Chardonnay moms can get behind this one too, you know? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think it's here to stay. There's also uh, many that are, you know, as we've said last year, if they're porch pounders, mm -hmm. um, they're gonna, they're gonna work well wherever, whatever scenario you're in. Yeah, they're easy to understand. <clears throat> um, I'll throw in one more thing because of the high acid generally in these wines, um, they're going to work with a lot of food that you, you serve them with. Okay. Uh, last thing about the history. Um, they were one of the first regions outside of Bordeaux to, uh, uh, to classify Grand Cru's. Uh, again, kind of interesting because of the history of the region has not been for quality wine, but introducing this concept is to try and help reinforce that they were trying to make quality wines. <coughs> okay, so, um, oh yeah, and two noteworthy ones. Remember these, we will be talking about them in a few slides. All right, so location and climate, lots of little details here. Um, key things, like I said, um, Previously, you see the Rhone River over here. So it came out of, out of Lake Geneva, way up at the top here, uh, wound its way down and now comes out into the Mediterranean. Um, you see large areas here um, in color for Provence. Um, but as you see in my notes, it's really not that big. It's about um, 150 miles east to west, 100 north to south, and those are not contiguous areas. So you can go multiple miles between vineyards um, because it, the, the ter terrain, even though I showed a very idyllic picture of what it looks like there, um, there's lots of hills. Um, it is a very uh, varied terrain, but what's <coughs> good about the areas that are planted they have high quality soils. Um, so there's lots of landstone in the area. Um, there is some chalk and silica, um, specifically around um, uh, this area, Ballet, which is, where, where'd she go? Uh, out there. But in Bandol and Palette, those two areas I said to remember, um, they're limestone. And we're gonna keep hearing this as we go through multiple regions throughout the world. Um, vineyard areas on limestone because they help to um, <coughs> maintain acidity are great for um, great for grape growing, um, especially in warm regions. And this region, because it's on the Mediterranean coast, can anybody guess what the climate is? I don't really know. <laughs> say it. Say it. Say it. Mediterranean. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> um, which it's kind of curious because you go a little bit, you go a little bit east, um, you go this way, and you get into the Piemonte region. And Piemonte region has mountains on the coast as well as north of it. And it is a very continental region. What allows this to stay maritime, uh, at least Mediterranean, is there are mountains protecting it to the north. And while we think of this as a really, really warm 
uh, area, it's only because of the protection of the Black Mountains that it gets this um, idyllic kind of, um, you know, the French Riviera kind of feel. It's because it's protected. It would be interesting to see what it would be like without that protection. Um, you'll see here this term, Mistral Wind. It's going to become prevalent in other areas of France that we talked about. It's a cool wind basically coming out of the north. So realistically coming out of Switzerland and Lake Geneva, because that's where the Rhone River comes out of. And that's kind of where the wind originates. Um, the other thing that I, I put in here that I think is um, going to be a challenge for Provence is you're on this idyllic coast. You're on the Mediterranean Sea. Would you rather build a nice chateau or with vines or a hotel that can have a lot of people there and make a lot of money? Of course, right now, I think it's obvious the chateau with vines will probably make you more money because nobody's coming to your hotel. But that's that'll hopefully change. Okay. Stock grapes. We're starting to see more and more regions, <clears throat> especially when they're not classic regions, that they have a lot of different grapes. And I've highlighted um, the key grapes in, in, I bolded them. So these are more the classic grapes of the region. The ones that I've italicized in red, um, those three grapes, uh, Grenache, Syrah, Mavedra, or GSM, um, are go you're going to see that as the key grapes in most of the wine regions all across the south of France. Um, the rules on what percentages will vary, but if somebody asks you what's in uh, a wine from the south of France that has a specific name or region attached to it, it's a good chance it's Grenache, Syrah, and Mavedra in some combination. Um, but you can see there's lots of other things that can be included. Now, um, in this region, again, just like Jura and Savoy, there's um, a bunch of regional grapes that are quickly vanishing just because they, they don't fit into the modern profile of the wines that are being produced there. Um, and what are modern profiles? Well, these are the two classic red, uh, classic wines of the region. Um, Provence Rosé, which the newer versions are very light, um, bright in acidity, low in alcohol, great for uh, drinking in summer um, and being able to have multiple glasses without um, falling over. And then you have what I think are the undiscovered really uh, wines of Provence, which are the Bandol Reds. Um, these are made predominantly from Vedro. And um, as you can see by the, the taste profile, if you like full body reds um, with moderate alcohol, these are great options to um, wines from Bordeaux or from the Rhone Valley. So that, <clears throat> Again, lots of <laughs> lots of words, um, but I'm going to pick on a couple of things here. Um, Cote de Provence. So when we think of rosé from this region, Cote de Provence is going to be the major um, appellation or region you're going to get this from. Um, just real quick, can go back to the map, and you'll see Cote de Provence is the the biggest area. It's this salmon or pale pink, uh, if we were uh, assessing it, area that covers quite a lot of the region. Um, they got a little spot in the mountains there. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's probably because it was a previous, that's kind of curious, it's isolated on its own, but we'll go into it. I don't know why that why that is. Um, and then the Kotec, the Vara, and these other smaller regions there, as we see here, 
um, you know, they're mostly rosé as well. So Cote de Provence, 75% um, of the region's total production, 70 75% of that production is rosé. And then you get these other two relatively big regions that are also mostly rosé. And now you can see why most people, when they think of Provence, think of rosé. Um, the palette was one of the, <clears throat> the Grand Cru's I wanted you to remember. There is one chateau in there, Chateau Simon, uh, which I think there's a bottle of right there. Uh, they make red, whites, and rosés, but they basically run that uh, appellation. They have 106 acres on limestone, and they produce 80% of that AOC's production. Um, very good wines. Um, because there's only a small area for them, the prices of them are getting kind of high, though. Um, Bandol, white, red, and rosés. Um, I had a backup to my backup bottle, which is a Bandol rosé. I'll grab it in a second or uh, when we get to the tasting because it's interesting to see what the rosé from that region is like. Um, one of the major producers in here, Domaine Cambier, is, um, again, a classic producer, uh, but from a smaller region. So while it's a good option to, um, to full body reds, um, the better producers in the region are starting to get a little more expensive. Um, with that, I've covered everything that I wanted to for all three regions. Um, I do have key, key information here um, in the appendix. Uh, one of the things, you know, like I said, Vin de Provence um, has a separate website from Bandol. So they, while they're both in Provence, um, they actually separate themselves in the way that they market. Also, Chateau Marivelle, I hate to admit it, but they were probably one of the biggest influences in starting the rosé craze um, or helping to further it along. Um, and if you don't know Chateau Marivelle, maybe somebody on the call could tell, tell us why it's important. I don't know the answer. I know they have a nice looking bottle, John. I can picture their bottle. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a minute. Yeah. Because of the distribution of the products? Like, I see it like in every wine shop I go into. Okay. Okay. Kendra, do you know? That's the uh, Brangelina, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Brangelina? Yep. Yeah. They had, they had bought into it um, back about probably about 10 years ago and it's 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 coincidental that um both of you said something that is a direct result of that purchase the recognizable bottle and you see it everywhere it's because they were able to get it in um distribution and production um throughout the world where it might not have been before yeah, Brad Pitt just did like a big kind of um, photo shoot recently of him like lounging by the pool drinking his rosé. <laughs> so I don't know if, like maybe he got that out of the divorce. I don't know. Um, well, <laughs> their their company that owns it also has started production of a rosé champagne. Right. Yeah, that's true. That happened as well. Which, which you'll probably see all over the place as well pretty soon <clears throat> okay i'm gonna go grab that backup backup bottle that i had uh, but i can still hear you guys so we've done we've done nose appearance we've done technicals and flavor um let's do some quality assessment and suitability for aging and kendra why don't you kick us off okay i'll start us off so i said my wine is good um, the structure of the wine is quite balanced. There's really bright acidity, good palate, and it actually helps like lengthen some of those primary flavors. Um, I said the wine has some complexity, but I was really on the fence here. Um, it's primarily red fruit, but I did get some floral notes. I did get um, some 
wet rock and then I did get a little bit of like dried cranberry so I am going to give it complexity but I almost didn't um as for intensity though it was very medium so I'm gonna say it didn't reach that um and then the length as well I mean it was it was pretty short short and sweet trailed off quickly so I am yeah the wine is good as for bottle aging, I'm going to say no, it's not suitable for bottle aging for a few different reasons. One, the really pale color. Um, over time, this is going to dull and not be very nice. Um, number two, the structure of the wine isn't going to um, keep it healthy throughout the years, just because it's a very medium. And then the intensity. Everything was very muddled, as I said, so I just can't see that um, doing well over time. And then lastly, um, and something we kind of talked about on Thursday, but you know how rosés are always in clear bottles. And it's like kind of that marketing ploy so that you see the color and you want it, but um, it wouldn't be suitable for aging because it would be very susceptible to any sort of light. So um, no aging for me. Okay. All right, Kendra, why don't you pick who goes next? Oh, uh, let's go, uh, Michael and Ryan. Looks like you got your pen going, so I'm curious. <laughs> um, we said acceptable. We think that I, the both on the nose and on the palate, it was just so appley that it was kind of it wasn't it, complex. Yeah, everything like else was, was kind like, of lost. You had to really hunt for the rest, so it wasn't complex. You know, the flavor intensity was medium. It was kind of mediums everywhere like else. Middle of the road. The only yeah. thing that like had anything was like the finish, which yeah, was the, a little long. The finish, but we said that's because it was a but... punch of apple that was kept. The <laughs> apple just kept hanging. Out. <laughs> so. It was like apple juice with a little bit of alcohol. <laughs> a lot of alcohol. <laughs> um, <laughs> for the bottle aging, like, like the the. The alcohol wouldn't come off, would it? Or would the alcohol? No, alcohol is one of those things, just like acid is is going to stay pretty consistent. Um, in, a, in a white wine, you kind of look for, is there enough acid to be able to support fruit development? And, you know, it, uh, n there's a handful of white wines, that I think, are are good for long-term aging rest are pretty much drink now yeah all right i said not suitable as yeah, well that's my conclusion yeah. <laughs> i think that um i think that's um actually i don't mean this the wrong way but it hopefully it doesn't come it's probably one of your best assessments um because it's this is something that Kendra and I uh, found. It was very, it's really easy to do an assessment on a complex one because you can, there's a lot to talk about. It's really hard to do an assessment on a wine that just doesn't give you anything. And so to be able to do an assessment like that and then come up with, you know, it really is only acceptable is one of the toughest things to do um, when you're looking at wine. So, um, Congrats, guys. That I, the, and the fact that you both came up to the same conclusion, even better. Um, so, Adam, Ajda, no, no pressure on you now. <laughs> well, I know, right? Like, that was the first acceptable rating I think I've heard in any of these um, Saturday sessions. So, I yeah. thought they were being harsh, but maybe, <clears throat> maybe not. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot if you disagree, right? So I, I rated this as good. I mean, it is relatively simple, and maybe I'm not being harsh enough, right? It's basically primary flavors. Um, like we said, it was very peach forward on the nose and actually a little bit different on the palate. Um, so marked it down on complexity. Asta did get a little bit of yeastiness, but not much, um, mostly primaries. Length isn't long. Um, intensity is okay. Balance is, is fine, right? So I think it's a drinkable wine. I think I could 
can enjoy it on a, you know, on a hot summer day. Um, I would drink now. I wouldn't age it. And I gave it a good. What do you think? I think if, because there is high enough acidity, maybe it could age. Like maybe it would age the fruit a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but not like, like maybe another year, not, not more than that. Um, okay. Because I, I feel a lot of tingly like around my mouth, like even now still, like it's just very tingly. I feel like my lips are swollen actually because of it. Um, but yeah, I would say good as well. Okay. And I, I think it's fair for you guys to do that because you, it's all, when you get into good and um, acceptable, it's about being able to justify it. Um, because a, again, a complex wine, it's easy. Like, yeah, you know, there's flavors from all over the place. It's intense. The flavors linger. That's easy. Being able to say, you know, it's balanced, but there's not much else to it. You know, the, the fruits are, the flavors are just primary fruit. And even then, they're only from one or two categories. That's that's harder to do, and harder to justify than taking a ten-year-old Bordeaux from a from a great producer and saying, "Well, yeah, it's outstanding." So uh, I think you guys, it, it would be a toss-up of whether good or acceptable because I didn't hear you really call anything other than balance as being a strong component of the wine and right. you kind of kind of hummed and hawed around the the flavors and the intensity and length but not nothing was really compelling that's true yeah okay so uh as i promised this is the rosé i got from uh, Vandal. Now, as you can see, that is not the type of rosé that um, I think everybody expects. Yeah, that's All right. Yeah. Now, this is, um, there's a couple different ways you can make rosé. Um, and initially on, there's, there's one called um, the Saunier method, which is, Ajda, I'm going to test you again because you know you speak French. Um, do you can you tell us what Saunier means? Saunier, I'm like, saying it right. Saunier. It's a dream. It's a dream. Uh, not no no that's La Rev, isn't it? Or like there is a show called uh, La Rev. Yeah, hold on. Saunier. Saunier. Yeah, Saunier. S A I S A I G N E E. Yeah. Oh, Saigne is to bleed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. To bleed. <laughs> Sorry. Saigne. Saigne. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. See, this is where pronunciation is everything. No wonder when I ask a taxi driver to take me to the hotel, he takes me to the train station. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, you should not say video tech. That's the only word I remember. Video <laughs> tech. Le disco. No. Um, so uh, say it again. Sonye. Senye. Senye. So to bleed, yes. which is um, why we get a rosé this color from Bondal is when they're making their red wine to concentrate it a little bit they will bleed off a little bit of the early press juice or uh, the fermenting juice to concentrate the rest of the juice. And that early juice is this color. And so you get the bled off method rosé being deeper and darker. The rosé that Kendra has is a direct press. So they take the grapes and treat it as the red grapes and treat it as white wine put into a big bladder press. And it gets a little bit of color from just that gentle press in, um, in the machine. So those two different methods result in two different styles. And this, again, is a byproduct of red wine making rather than a direct intention 
of making rosé. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, we're just a little bit over time, but um, it was fun being able to, to dig into some uh, adjacent topics. Um, next week, we are off. Um, we do the three three weeks on, one week off. The f oh, we're starting the next week. We're going to stay in France at least for the month of March, and we're looking at one of the biggest, most intimidating regions in France, in Bordeaux. Uh, we're going to start on the left bank, go to the right bank, and then cover what realistically is most of Bordeaux in other Bordeaux in the third week. So, um, you know, if you guys have any questions, comments, if you want to get some tips on what to buy, I've, I've updated the, um, the recommended wine sheet, but if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, with that, enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye guys. Bye guys. Bye. Guys. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.